Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of the Cree, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Soto people and the homeland of the Metis Nation. I'm dedicating, I'm dedicated to ensuring that in the spirit of reconciliation, Treaty 6 is honored and respected. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of the First Nations Language Keepers Gathering for offering me this time to speak to everybody. Uh, I was also uh, supported to come here by a scholarship, the Paul Reynolds Scholarship, so I wanted to acknowledge uh, the people that, that supported me to come here and to present to you today. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the name of this uh, presentation. It's Te Reo Māori Mua Pōpōrao Hoa Tahira. Māori language tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. It's literally Māori language tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. Te reo Māori mua pōpōrao ho atahira. I'm going to play a clip from about 30 years ago. It's one of our great-grandfathers. And he's welcoming a group onto the marae, to the meeting area. He welcomes the group, but he pays particular attention to the young people. And he says, you, the young people, are the voice for tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. So he means you're the voice of the future. So he says, So it goes for about a minute and a bit. And you'll see one of our great grandfathers welcoming the young people to the marae and encouraging them to be the speakers tomorrow, which means into the future. So I'll see how this little thing goes. Here's Uncle Henry. Say the title of the thing at the end. He said, "You fellows are the, the real for tomorrow. You fellows are the speakers of tomorrow." So this is what I'm talking about today. I come from an audio-visual archive. We're in a national audio um, audio-visual archive, so we hold all sorts of collections of video, or film, and audio cassette tapes, video tapes. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Māori language collections that we hold as an archive and what we do with them 
how we preserve them, how we share our, our collections. Okay. My first question is Kei Fermato. Kei Fermato. So where is Aotearoa? Where is Aotearoa? Does that give you a good indication of where we are? Does it look familiar? Look unfamiliar? Uh, we're a little bit up from Antarctica. And a little bit of more familiarisation here. Um, on the left is what our country is represented as in a colonial kind of sense. On the right hand side we've got an artistic description or representation of, of our country. Uh, this morning my whanaun and my relation from Aotearoa talked about Maui. Neho, a main island in Hawaii is called Maui. We've got similar traditions, we've got the same ancestor. Maui fished up the North Island, so the Northern Island is, is a big fish, it's a big um, stingray. So he fished up that stingray. Below that fish you can see his, what, what's, what does that uh, look like? His, his boat, his canoe. So we refer to that island as the canoe of Maui and we refer to the Northern Island as the fish of Maui. And actually the one down the bottom there, that's actually the anchor. So that's where we are. And that's, um, that's a Maori view of, of, our, of our lands. This is who I work for. So it's an audiovisual archive. At the bottom there, there's a little picture of some of the, some of our collections. It's just a tiny representation of it. Of course, we hold film, video, audio, including some big Māori language collections and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the Māori language material that we hold. So some of our Māori language collections include our TVNZ items. TVNZ might be the same as CBC, might be a little bit different. It's, um, it's our state-owned television station. Uh, we, hold, we hold the whole archival collection including a whole lot of Māori material. We have state radio called RNZ, Radio New Zealand. Um, our state radio archive also has a lot of Māori material. We also have programs that are funded by Te Māngai Pāho. Te Māngai Pāho is, is funded by the government to produce indigenous programming. So I'll tell you a little bit more about TNP, Te Māngai Pāho here. They fund Māori television, Top there. So we have a, a two Māori television stations. Uh, they fund 21 tribal radio stations. Those are the black dots there. Most of them are in the fish of Maui. Is it the top one or the bottom one? The top one? The top one is the fish of Maui. And you see they've got 20 dots for the radio stations. And there's one in the canoe of Maui. One of the reasons for that is most Māori live in the north, in, in, the, in the fish of Māori. Something like 8% of our population are there. Probably because it's warmer, gets a bit cooler down south. Uh, and so that's what um, Mango Pāho pays these people to make these productions, and then we collect them and we store them for archival purposes. So some of the Māori language collections that we hold, we have a series called Waka Huia. it's a television series. It started back in 1987, so it's been going for more than 30 years, that's where that other clip was from, it was 32 years old. Uh, it's, it started off as a one hour interview with elders. In our radio collection we have 10,000 digital uh, Māori radio programs, some of them might be 5 minutes, some of them might be 20 minutes. And then those iwi radio stations, the tribal <coughs> radio stations, they also have stuff that they've been producing for 30 years, so they might have a room full of cassette tapes that they don't know what to do with. They will send them to us and we'll slowly digitise them so that they can reuse them again in a digital age. So the Wakawea programme started in 1987. At TBNZ, some of the Māori staff there, they, they looked around and they thought about all of the elders that were alive at the time and they thought, 
it'd be a really good time to capture a lot of their stories. Initially, the elders were reluctant to hand their, their stories over um, for a whole lot of reasons, because it's the genealogy, uh, because some of the, they, there, there are a whole lot of reasons. They weren't used to sitting in front of a camera and talking for an hour. However, there were a couple of elders in the north that uh, they got the ball rolling, they actually put their hand up and agreed, yep, you can come and interview us. When they agreed to that, word got around. And then some of the other tribes started to want to get in on the game. And, and they started to say yes too. So from 1987, uh, Wakabia started recording a whole lot of... Um, uh, they made a decision, a lot of these elders made a decision to go to TVNZ or to have TVNZ come to them and do some recordings and to interview them. And the result of this is that we've got these stories on hand now and that we can now learn these stories and their language. So they'll talk about their local history, they'll talk about the canoe that brought their people to this area, they'll talk about how they gather shellfish and how they, they, they just cover so many um, topics. Um, it's very popular today, this series. A lot of people um, get in touch with us and ask for copies of their grandfather or their great-grandmother. So today we have our people connecting with the language of their own family, of their own people. And there was even one tribe that they did a research project. They have got a whole lot of episodes from their area and they, they used it to develop a dictionary. So they got all these words, sentences, and were able to um, pull together the history of their language. And that dictionary was published this year. Uh, some of the unique things that sit within Makuhuya, that's the original graphics from 32 years ago. One of the last speakers of the Naitahi language. Uh, I think Naitahi, the native speakers, the last native speaker died in the early 1990s. So we were, they were able to capture them. Iwi are the tribes, all the tribes are represented all the way across our country. They have all the vocabulary, the vocab, the vocab for how to do things, like how to chop wood, how to make a fire, how to make a hangi and earth oven. So they actually demonstrate all of this language. And I'm going to play a clip now of one of the nannies, Emily Schuster. She was, she was known for making garments, for being a weaver for making garments. Um, so here she's going to demonstrate, what does she demonstrate? Um, one of the stages of making a garment. Uh, part of the process is to, um, to, to prepare the garment for dyeing. She's going to dye the garment. So she has soaked, she's boiled some water, she adds some leaves, she adds some bark, she boils it for 12 hours and then she puts the garment in to prepare it for the proper dyeing process. So there's all the words that's, uh, that's involved with that process that she uses. So hopefully it's going to play in a second. <coughs> this is Auntie Emily um, taking the leaves out of the mixture and then putting the garment in to prepare it, to prepare it for, to be dyed. <laughs> Kita kau, kita tahu tu pilih untuk 
So in the next stage, Auntie Emily is going to um, place the garment into a mud mixture. It's a special mud. She's got a special place where she gets the mud. She doesn't tell anyone where that special mud mixture is because it's, um, it's a family mud mixture. So she'll lift the garment from the mud and then she'll wash it clean. And then she'll show you how well the, the black part of the dye has set. She'll lift, the, lift and shake the garment. The mud will drop off. Then she'll wash it in the clean water. She'll shake it around. And she'll show you, she'll demonstrate how well the black has sunk into the garment. And then she, she takes it out and hangs it up in the sun, uh, dries it on the grass. It's a really valuable clip for us, for those of us that are learning, because there's so much vocab, there's so much really rich language and vocab in that kōrero, as well as if you want to learn how to make a pupu, how to make one of those garments, she, she, she makes it from go to wo in that clip. It's about an hour long, that, um, that episode, and yeah, it's, it's just really valuable kōrero, really valuable information for us. So that was one of our television programs. What uh, Ngā Kōrero is a radio collection. Um, here are a couple of our early broadcasters. I think from the 40s and the 50s, Wiri Mupaka, more late, like maybe more in the 60s and 70s, and Aireni Grinnell from the 40s and 50s. Uh, so what does this collection hold? It's fully digitised. There's 10,000 audio items. One of our elders actually digitised that collection over about five years and then they found that there was a, an error so they had to go and do it all again so they worked on that collection for about 10 years. However, not the whole, the whole collection isn't fully catalogued so some of the items in that collection it just says recording in Gisborne 1967 so you don't actually know what's on it so part of our job is to continue to catalogue and to find out what's in that collection. Uh, so. We got three youth interns in a couple of years ago to catalogue some of those items, so 700, they, they, they made a start. And then all of those 700 items, we placed them online so that anyone can listen to them on the internet. Um, some of the items in the Ngā Taonga Kōrero collection, uh, a 106-year-old that was interviewed in 1972, so he was born in the 1860s. So the, the young fellow that was Catalog, and we couldn't actually understand what he was saying. He had to listen to it about 10 times because that's how hard it was. It's so long since that um, person, uh, the language had changed so much. We've got some of our origin stories. There's a whole series, about six episodes, where they cover off a whole lot of origin stories. In the South Island, which is the canoe of Maui, a whole lot of traditional chants an opening ceremony for a meeting house in 1938, and I'll show you a photo of that opening soon. And um, some exemplary language of 
Ida Grinnell, 1949. So this is 1949, it's very sort of dated. This is when on the radio you had to speak in uh, received English or the Queen's English. So you'll notice in her English that she's got a very English kind of accent from her um, RNZ training or whatever it was called at the time. She talks about unity between Māori and Pākehā, which are non-Māori or white people. And um, yeah, she gives a little Christmas message back in the day. the uh, opening of one of our houses, um, our, our meeting houses, in 1938. You can see the camera, uh, the camera, the microphone there on the right, capturing all of the, the discussion and the performances. This group is about to perform. This was the opening ceremony for Tūrungo House at Tūrungo Waiwai Marae Ngāu This is actually, um, this, we have the recordings. So it's very useful to, to listen to our people talking and giving formal speeches in 1938 and there's a few sort of um, political people here as well like the, I don't know if the Prime Minister was there but the guy on the left there is the Minister for Māori Affairs so he spoke, uh, there's a whole lot of really important speeches that were recorded from that event. So what did the interns learn? These are the three interns that we got um, from the university down the road. Um, they were really excited to listen to the elders, some of them they'd only heard about, they had heard the names of these elders, um, but they never actually heard their voices. They told us that it gave them really in-depth knowledge about the songs and the customs that they had grown up with at school. Um, the one on the left there, um, she talked about how for the first time ever she heard one of her nannies from the East Coast. And, and she was so excited, she took all of the links from the collection and she took it back to her own people so that her own people and her family could, could listen to the recordings um, of her, because they're another generation, probably her great great grandparents and great grandparents. I mean, we, people that are a little bit older than them, we almost knew them, some of these people. This is part of our role as, as an archive because we get government funding. Right there, it's from uh, our government, our New Zealand government, Māori language strategy. The Māori language strategy of the government says that if there are Māori language resources that the Crown has holds, then the Crown wants to make them more available so that people can learn from them. So under this strategy, um, what we do, because we hold the TVNZ collection, because we hold the RNZ collection, we do it the best that we can do to share those collections. So now Tonga as an archive, um, we're committed to the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, Carwin this morning talked about the Treaty of Waitangi. We're committed to supporting that, which means that we support iwi, we support the tribes. If they have language plans, if they have language work, if they want to access some of this stuff, we'll do our best that we can do to get it to them. If it's sitting in a, on a shelf somewhere, in an analogue format like a cassette tape, we can't just send it, we need to digitise, so we can't always do it as quickly as we'd like to, but we do our best. How do we support language revitalisation? 
and we support our generations like that intern there. I mean, we connect her with the, with the recordings of her grandparents and great-grandparents. We do our best to provide access to the collections. Um, we put the we put material online. We provide services to Māori. So the government gives us money to digitise these collections, to archive the Māori television collections, and then put them online. When they're online, then anybody can access them. This is an exhibition that we did. It's an online exhibition. So these are eight nannies, eight grandmothers from all around the country. The recordings are from 1993. They discuss their lives, their philosophies, their skills, their whakapapa, which is their genealogy. So they tell us all the whole bunch of stories. We don't play the whole recordings, we just play little snippets, three minute snippets. So if you click on any of them at our website, um, you can listen to eight or nine recordings from each of one of those grandmothers. So it's, um, you can learn about your own tribe if your tribe is there, or you can just learn generally about uh, some of those um, those older Māori women talking about their lives. The second one in there from the left, she was almost 100 when that was recorded. So again, it's, it's sort of a connection to a life that we've never, uh, I've never experienced. They lived on the land, they fished from the sea, that was their whole life. They lived in Māori communities where Māori was spoken, and that was, again, that was something that my generation never experienced. So it's a really good um, little collection of uh, recordings here of this online exhibition. We'll tweet and Facebook and social media stuff. Um, we'll do it in Māori and we'll do it in English. Um, this is a little story about one of our, our workers, Lamari. Uh, so we'll just tell a little story and put a link there. There's a link there to a blog that she wrote. She wrote a blog about the work that she does. You can see her capturing a whole lot of Māori television programs there. So she captures them, puts them into the system. In 50 years' time, we hope that someone will come and come looking for their people. And that's your country to that. Cataloging. It's really important to catalog so that if you come looking for someone like um, looking for a particular name, a particular place, if it's not in the catalog you, you won't be able to find that information. Uh, one of the things about my language is that we all speak the same language. Uh, am I right in that there's a lot of different languages here in Turtle Island? And sometimes you can understand other people, sometimes you can't because you speak different languages. In, in, in Māori we speak one language. So from the top of the north to the bottom of the south we can all understand each other. You might not understand me because of my accent, but I'll, I'm trying to speak as clear as I can. Um, there are a few variations in our words. So the word on the left there for a, like a fish or a chi. There's one small difference. Where I come from, we say tetehi, the bottom one, and then we come and come for this, for example, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, they say tetehi. So if you say a che, I would say tetehi tūru, and he might say tetehi tūru. But we can understand each other. Similarly for the plural, some chairs, we drop the T to make it plural, we don't put an S on che, because we haven't got an S. Um, Plural is in the a and the sum. Any linguists that know what those kind of words are? They're not verbs. I'm not very good with this. Any linguists in the room? What's a and sum? Anyway, words to tell you how many things there are. So, again, etihi and etahi. Ancestors, when we talk about ancestors, you can tell where someone's from by the way they say ancestor. Where I come from, we say tūpuna. And over on the east coast, where uh, Carl's from, they say tipuna. And in the South Island, yeah, there's, you can tell where someone's from the way they use, by the words they use. But we can understand each other. We can understand each other because it's the same word with the same meaning. Also, um, when we say ancestor, it could mean grandparent, or it could mean someone from 10 generations ago. So there's no sort of distinction. My grandfather is my tipuna, even if he's still alive. 
So when we do catalog, our little cataloging team of two people, uh, they catalog in Māori language. But we have a group that kind of oversees all of the cataloging work because we want to make sure that they get it accurate and correct. And there's a set of national guidelines for the way that we write in Māori. That we can see the word Māori there's got a little macron. So the old national guidelines say if it's a long vowel, then you put a macron on it. Um, which is why we say Māori, not Māori. Māori. Uh, so yeah, we have a group that supports that um, for catalogers to do their work. Was that a question? Yeah. I can't help myself. Well, next year, guys, huh? We have a Māori Language Commission. The Māori Language Commission is a state-funded body, um, but the representatives are Māori language experts from around the country. Yeah, so it um, can be a little bit controversial. Yeah, I was just going to say that because um, also ownership is an issue too, right? Ownership to, especially when the state had control of the recordings in the early years, they started recording. Yeah. They are uh, um, native people, they are catalogers. They're very valuable and they're rare. Yeah. We had trouble <laughs> recruiting them. Yeah. And one of them was the original interns. So he stayed on. So the um, so the Tiana there on the right and Kimi and Maya in the middle. They stayed on. They stayed on and carried on in that work. Kimi and Maya left for another opportunity, but Tiana saw what us doing the catalogue. So um, while we have these standards, these national guidelines, it's really um, so that there's only one way of writing Māori, for example. Otherwise, you have three ways of writing it. And if you go looking for it, you've got to search three different words for the same word. So we, we try to, if we write a word, we try and write it the same every time. Yeah. Give or take a couple of words, there's always exceptions. Uh, so what do we do? We have a, there's an exam that the Māori Language Commission holds and that exam gives you a scale of 1 to 5. It gives you an indication of your skill level and that's useful because it means that we can um, then, if you get a 3, for example, it means that we can help you to develop in this area or this area. If you get a 5, if you're at the top of the scale, well, technically you don't need a lot of development and maybe you can support the other um, in terms to with their work. Uh, it also tells us when we have all our Māori stuff, there's about eight of us. We've made, I think we've all set the exam now, and so we all have a, a feel. In that the, the results of the exam have given us a feel for where we're at in, our, in terms of our skill level. And we have a small um, bonus. If you sit the exam and you get your result, you get a small bonus, which means that we recognise people for using their Māori language skills at work. If, if the person is speaking in Māori, we'll catalogue it in Māori. Uh, some, we'll try and use the dialect of the speaker, you know those words that I had before, if they say tetehi, we'll try and write tetehi, tetehi. Sometimes if the cataloger is from somewhere else, they'll just use their own language, but that's just what happens. It's still the same, it's the same information. We follow those national standards, and um, again, we bring the language of those traditional speakers to the community and back to their families by, by putting it up online. This is one of our, I think it's just about the first book of the episode in 1987. It was old Hen, Hemi Henari, that second name there. Hemi Henari was one of those ones that, and he was like a chief. He was one of the you know, top five chiefs, if you like, at the time. When he agreed to go to, to the interview, a whole lot of other people said, oh yeah, we'll be interviewed if old, if old Hemi's doing it. We don't mind um, having our stories recorded. And Mira Sazi as well. Mira Sazi also agreed to have her, uh, um, her voice interviewed, and that's a little description at the bottom. So there's a little Māori language description at the bottom. Sometimes we place restrictions on our material. Um, we would place a restriction on a material, on material where it hasn't been broadcast before. 
So somebody went out and did an interview on behalf of the radio station, but it never got broadcast. So if we know that the person knew that they were going to be on TV or on radio, then the chances are they wouldn't mind us putting their stuff on online. But if it was never broadcast, then because we don't know that they agreed, or if we don't know that they agreed, then we won't put it online. We have guardians of our different titles, and they have a particular relationship to that and digit to that knowledge. So they might say to us, we're going to put some restrictions on this material. And we'll develop relationships with those kaitiaki, with those guardians. I'll give you an example. So, guardians might place restrictions on access to these taonga, to these treasures, so that we can ensure culturally appropriate use and to protect those treasures and the knowledge, the Māori knowledge, from inappropriate use. The kinds of restrictions that we'll put on will be placed by the people, by the kaitiaki, not us, but the people that have got a connection to the material. And the, the, those people are the ones that always decide how that material can be used. So for example, we've got a documentary of a land occupation in the 1970s. There was a 500 day land occupation in, in Auckland, in our largest city. One of the members of the tribe from that place they had told us that if that, if that documentary is going to play, their tribe needs to be present. Their tribe needs to be there to present the documentary and to be present. So that's one of the restrictions that they place on us. We only hold the material and we work with the kaitiaki, with the guardians, to, to support us in how we share the material. Does that make sense? It's, it's not our decision, it's the, the guardians' decision tribal guardians. They help us because they help us to keep they help to keep us safe and to uphold the modi of the material, the life force of what's embodied in that material. But it's the core level, the people speaking that has its own modi, its own life force of its own. So we we're really grateful that the guardians support us to keep us safe in the way that we hold on to these these collections. Are we on the right path? What do you think about the work that we do? Um, have a look at our website. And if there's any questions, um, fire away, please. We have a similar concept of kaitiakitanga, of guardianship, is something that we get from the Māori world and that we've, we've, we've um, adopted into our organisation. We're largely, we've got about 10 Māori staff and 50 non-Māori staff, but all staff uh, have to follow this kaitiaki policy, this guardianship policy. cover the full spectrum. You have um, Pakeh, which is um, white people. We have Pakeh people that uh, don't want their kids to learn Māori at school and don't want to see Māori on signs. We're moving towards having Māori and English signs and there's some people that object to that. I don't know what the problem is because it's only information. Uh, and 
mean, we've also come a full circle. We've got a lot of um, Pākehā people that want to learn the language. So there are tertiary programs where they have waiting lists now. This has only happened in the last five years, where non-Indigenous people um, are lining up to learn the language. So uh, it's been a full circle that took about 40 years. 40 years ago, it wasn't even on the radar. But through promotion and just through osmosis, and um, we've got to a point now where uh, more than half of the population think that the Māori language is valuable. They do surveys. And most, of, most people in Aotearoa agree that the language is valuable, that it has a place, that there should be schools that teach the language. So there's some that aren't supportive, but and if you work for government, technically you're, you're obliged to have some basic Māori language skills. People are supposed to know how to pronounce words properly. It's like a bottom line in schools, in the police, and government, and hospitals. That's, that's, that's what we aim for. Any other questions? We don't provide material unless the guardians agree to it. Um, and the way that our website is structured, it's hard to rip stuff off online. We don't put it on YouTube. We just put it on our website, um, which makes it harder to exploit. Uh, so if somebody wanted to use somebody's talk in an advertisement or a commercial or in a film or in a piece of art, they need to ask permission. And if things do go wrong, there was recently a TV program where uh, a man had been taking photos of ancestors and putting tattoos all over their faces. And when he put it on TV and, and he was talking about it like it was you know, artistic license, then a lot of people objected and uh, this had nothing to do with us supplying the material. But yeah, there's a, there's a strong... Um, sense in Aotearoa that you can't just exploit Māori culture because Māori people will say, hey, this is unacceptable. This is a sacred image of one of our grandmothers and we don't want you to, to just turn it into a piece of art. So the protection that we have is that we won't provide the material unless we have a really clear understanding. We, we get people to sign the contract, yeah, about how they... So an example, um, there was a battle in the 1860s there's a Māori artist that wrote a song, she wrote a rap song, and she started the song with a little 30 second clip of one of the elders talking about that battle. He was, he was recorded in the 1960s, <coughs> and she, so she blends it into her little rap song, and there's a little bit of a quote from one of your great-grandfathers. And it was agreed to, um, we supplied the footage, and all she needed to do was um, credit where the material had come from. There's a whole lot of ways of reusing this material in the modern context. But then here's our website, our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram feeds. Actually, um, the last session that I went to, or was it earlier today, where um, somebody talked about how they wanted to transform the school, it was one of the young people up on the stage, how she would really like the schools to, and it doesn't have to be nine to three, I mean, to really indigenize our school. All, all I can talk about is what we've done. Um, in the 1980s, all of the grandmothers and grandfathers they took all the 
under five year olds and set up language nests, but do it in their garage, in their lounge room. And that was how it started. When those kids turned five and went to school, well, everybody decided the best place to carry on this learning is they went and took over the schools. Where they took over the schools was that they, they'd start off with a bilingual unit, and then over time, some schools became full Māori language schools. So that's been the solution for us, rightly or wrongly. Um, school is now the, the main, one of the main places that we have language revitalisation happening. Quite often, it's, the parents don't speak. So the parents don't speak, the teachers speak, so the kids get it from nine till three. Thank you.